Welcome to the unofficial House of Wind book club, ran by two best friends and self-declared members of the Night Court. Today we are discussing chapters 23 and 24 of A Court of Thorns and Roses. I know you can hear me from the dark. I know you're listening from afar. Hey, Abby, what? how's your week going? Mm-hmm. Stole it. I hit a goal that I've been reaching for since, well, realistically my whole life. So that's pretty cool. I lost 100 pounds. Good Lord. So you guys, you've seen my update from, I think the first time we did this podcast, I lost 80 or 70. Yeah, so we did 70, 80, 90, and now I hit 100. So I'm pretty pleased with that. I had my doctor's appointment. That's like 30 pounds within a, about 11 episodes. I know this is 12, but like between 11 episodes, you've lost 30 pounds. I went to my doctor and he was like, I'm really proud of you, hmm. but the fight's not over. And I was like, oh, dang it, sir. But he's right. Can I have this real quick then, sir? Can we just not? No. Can we be excited about this for a second? I had like one day where I was like, oh, this is pretty cool. And then he was like, "Mm, so you're not done. And I was like, thanks, sir. But I'm personally pretty proud of myself because that's like three toddlers no longer on my body. That's about a middle schooler right there. Yeah, I went from a size 28 to 2830 to 1618. And I in 20 pounds will get my tummy tuck, which is really cool. So pretty proud of that that's amazing that's a lot that's a lot of weight how is your week it's been eventful that's for sure i've had a couple things going on as we know early on into the podcast i was sick for about a month straight i got a horrible ear infection i don't know if i ever brought that up i'm sure i did it was so bad abby you know it was very bad the doctors were freaking out it was horrible The pain finally went away, but I never got my hearing back. So I figured, you know, it's uh, it's been a few weeks since I've been able to hear out of that ear. I went into the doctor and they were not pleased to tell me that I had a decent sized hole in my eardrum, which is why I can't hear out of that ear. It's going to take some time for the hole to, I guess, heal on its own. Then I will have to go get an auditory test to see how much hearing I have permanently lost because the damage is it's done. And we don't know how much hearing I'll get back. So that that was my not super fun part of my week. But it got <laughs> it got more entertaining, I guess. My dad and two of my sisters came to visit. And when they did, I convinced my dad and my older sister, not older to me, but she's older than the other one, and my husband to play the trolley game with me, which is a card game by Cyanide and Happiness, where you have two railroads and there's two teams. You lay down two cards of basically like innocent people. And then you have a guilty card of like bad people. And you have to defend your train lines and try to convince the conductor to run over the other train. So like the first train line could be like a very happy dog, Helen Keller. And then it's like a notorious cannibal. And it's like, now how do you defend saving the first two when you also have a notorious cannibal on the same track versus whatever the other people have on their track? And my sister was the conductor. And my dad laid down, I believe it was my dad, laid down a card about how the choice was between, I I did have Helen Keller at that point. No, I had Betty White. And I I, I don't... Oh, I love her. Right, I had Betty White. I had... um, I think it was like a middle school robotics team. And I don't know who my bad guy was. But then like my dad had like your best friend. And so she ran over my train track. And she was like, to be fair, her fiance, Maddie, she was like, I, I can't run over Maddie. I like that's going to be my wife. I can't run over my soon to be wife. That She's my best friend. And she was like, and then our other sister is my best friend. And that was it. She stopped there. And I was like, thanks. You don't count. Thanks, sunshine. We've had a lot longer of a history than our, our sister, who's still a toddler, 
but that's cool. You know, I don't count as a best friend. She was like, well, it's just, I just don't want to admit. I was like, okay, all right, this is going on the podcast. And she was like, no way. And I was like, yes, it is. So here it is, sunshine. The world can know I apparently don't count as a best friend. It's okay, though, because she came over to grab her headband that she had left, that my other sister had left, her, you know, her best friend. She came to pick it up, and I, uh, I was like, sorry, only best friends allowed in this house. You don't count anymore, I guess. I apparently don't. That's fine. She could have just said it. She didn't have to mean it. She could have just been like, yeah, you know, you're my best friend, too. Like, you could have just amused me, given me a little bit of a confidence boost. But she was like, hey, but no, yeah, you're not part of that equation. This is why we do not play board games with family. Hey, you know what, though? Joke's on her. She asked me to be her maid of honor for her wedding. So I have a speech coming up, and I'm apparently not her best friend. Mm -hmm. So watch out. Don't plan a Disney trip on her wedding. I don't want to hear it, Abigail. You know what? No, that is, you planned a wedding during my Disney trip. Our trip was established long before. Libby didn't love me enough for my wedding. That's not fair. Disney's always there, but my wedding's only there once in a lifetime. Abby rescheduled. <laughs> no. That's not fair, Abby. You rescheduled your wedding to the one week. No, the military rescheduled my wedding. I didn't get to choose anything. No! <laughs> Just so everybody knows. Libby, what if aliens landed on Earth today and offered you to abduct you? Would you go with them? You don't get to slide by. That's crap. Whatever. Fine. Question of the week, as Abby's trying to say, if aliens landed on Earth today and offered to abduct you, would you go with them? And you know what? Maybe I should. Because apparently my sister was it does not think of me as a best friend. And apparently I schedule Disney plans for wedding. I I, I just need to start over. So yeah, I'm ready to go. Let's let's can I bring my husband and my kid? Like, can I bring them at least? I have a very simple answer to this question. Yes. Okay. Because have you seen the price of milk? Yeah. Or gas or anything in the States? Like Italy has like, some expensive things, but like food and like cost of living is relatively low here. Have you gone to the Walmart and tried to buy anything that wasn't a hundred dollars? Without crying? No. Mm, well then no. No. So I would like to be abducted to 1920, where I could buy things for cents. But I want my bank account now, but I want to live in 1920 with the aliens. I'm ready. I Wait, in 1920 with the aliens? I don't know. I think I'd be a cool flapper. Do you think that like they have all the 1920 issues that we had in the 1920s? No, because I'd be rich. Oh, I don't know. There's, there's a lot of... Uh sexism and racism and homophobia we're gonna slide past that i'm going to the dream of 1921 where everything's perfect we're gonna skip past all those things okay so in alien world those things aren't happening in 1920 right no okay no it's perfect we're good okay as long as like those aren't happening in the alien 1920s because i can't do it when people are like i was born in the wrong era i'm like you know what happened in that era you think you want to be born in right you, right like you think you want to be born into that era but you know what actually went down then, right? You're not forgetting how privileged you would have been in that era? Because I'm going to my dream 1920s where everything was happy and everybody lived in cute little uh, soda shops and listened to fun music on records. That's what I'm going to. You know what would be so disappointing is to like be abducted by aliens and then to find out they have some sort of ick to them. Everything has an ick. I'm sure it's going to be gross. The U.S. just decided to like, since everything's burning to the ground, we'll just slide in the fact aliens are real. And hopefully nobody notices. We don't care anymore because everything's just so much. You know what's alarming to me, though, is that if aliens are real, we must be really messing up if they don't want to come talk to us or make themselves known to everybody. If they were like, you know what? We're going to let your government have this one. We're ruining our Earth. They don't want us. The aliens don't even want to abduct us. No. Can we ask? Is it even abducting us? If we're asking to go. Okay, I've got a brighter note. Okay. I was going through and highlighting my chapter and yours just so I could know what was going on. Mm -hmm. And I just kept going because these are short chapters. They really were. And I've been used to our, our really long chapters. So I, without thinking about it, did chapter 25 and chapter 26 without knowing. Good Lord. Because these chapters are so short. Bestie, thank you for giving us a, a little break for a week. It was very nice of you. 
but not gonna lie, I really do like these two chapters. Are you ready to talk about them? Yes. Go for it. Chapter 23, we find Favor laying in the grass, strategizing how she might capture the warmth of the sunshine shining through the leaves above in one of her paintings. Lucian was gone on emissary duties, so Favor was left alone, alone with Tamlin. Tamlin had brought Feyre to a grassy glen that had a stream running through it. He was napping next to Feyre as she admired his golden hair and golden mask against the emerald green of the surrounding scene. She holds her gaze on his pointed ears when he softly wakes and tells her that the willow singing always makes him drift off to sleep. Feyre is confused what he is talking about, though. Tamlin tells her that her senses are limited as a human, so there are things she doesn't see or hear, and part of that are the willow singing. Tamlin offers to make her able to see hear and taste his world, drawing attention to the bite mark bruise on her neck as he says the last part, despite her human senses. However, it comes with a price, a kiss. Favor frowns and refuses, but she's grasping fistfuls of grass to restrain from reaching out to him. Tamlin tells her that he is a high fae and they don't give anything without receiving something in return. Favor surprises herself and agrees. Tamlin is also surprised that Favor agrees, but tells her to close her eyes, then kisses each of her closed eyelids. Favor is breathless, but as Tamlin pulls away, she can hear around her the sound of whimsical birds and an ethereal melody of a pensive woman, the willow. Favor's eyes fly open, and the world around her now seems clear. Water flowed smoothly, trees shimmered, and their leaves radiated, but most of all, there was no metallic sting to the smell of magic. It now smelled of jasmine, lilac, and roses. Favor felt she could never paint it, not in its entirety. Everything was magic, and it broke her heart. Favor looks to Tamlin, only to feel her heart shatter further. His skin had a golden glow, and the sun shone around his head. Every hue of green and gold surrounded him, and she remembered that he was a high lord of Prithian. Favor holds her breath as she grasps the mask on his face and gently tries to remove it, and Tamlin merely smiles as her attempt fails. Favor blinks, and the otherworldly beauty fades, but she can still hear the music around her. Tamlin altered the glamour so she couldn't fully see the world again, just like before. He used it to look as normal as possible, but he couldn't hide everything, seeing as he is a high lord and those powers come with physical markers. Favor asks if the mask can be removed by someone from another court. She just wants to know what he looks like. She imagined he has a strong, straight nose, high cheekbones, and a slightly arched brow. Tamlin is grinning with all of his teeth on display. He leans in to a now sleepy Favor, asking about her end of the deal. The kiss she owes him. Favor hurriedly and roughly kisses the back of his hand and Tamlin bursts out with laughter. Favor is lulled to sleep by the willow. Tamlin softly says he should bring her home, but instead curls in close to her and strokes her hair as she falls deeper into sleep. Favor knows she has never slept so perfectly before. Tamlin whispers to Favor that she is exactly as he had dreamed she'd be too. Favor allows the rest of her to succumb to the dark, peaceful sleep. Chapter 24. Feyre awoke to a buzzing noise. She sat up and found a short woman with tree bark for skin who had brought in breakfast. Feyre asked where Alice was. She knew she would have remembered a fairy with skin like hers and definitely would have already painted it. She asked the woman if Alice was unwell and made sure she looked around to confirm she was in her own bedroom. The woman asked if she had lost her mind. With a shake of her head, the woman replied that she was Alice. She then left the room to start Feyre's bath. Impossible, Feyre thought. Her Alice looked like a high fae, but then she remembered what Tamlin had called it, a glamour. Tamlin had glamoured everything around her, as she now realized, because she would have been terrified of it all when she had first arrived. On her trek downstairs, she was stunned to see so many masked fairies walking around, none that she had seen before. While some looked like humans, many did not. Those were the especially unnerving ones. As she entered the dining room, she was grateful to see that Lucian still looked like himself. Tamlin asked her what was wrong, and she replied that there were a lot of fairies, uh, uh, there were a lot of people, um, uh, fairies around the house. She asked when they had arrived. Fairy remembered earlier how she almost screamed when she looked out her window and saw many masked fairies tending to the garden. Those had interest to her most of all. Many had insect masks and iridescent wings. Tamlin tried not to smile and stated they'd been here all along. Favor replied, but she hadn't heard or seen anything. Lucian cut in. Of course she didn't see anything. They'd made sure that she only saw and heard those who were necessary. Embarrassed, Feyre realized that the night she ran out after the puka, she had to had an audience. She learned that the reason she could see the other creatures that she had, the Naga, Puka, and Surreal, was because they weren't members of Tamlin's court. His glamour had no effect on them. Lucian laughed at her surprise, and she thus glared at him, noticing that he'd been away from the manor a lot recently. He replied that he'd been busy, and assumed Feyre had been so too. 
She questioned him, like, what could that possibly mean? Lucian replied, if I offer you the moon on a string, will you give me a kiss too? Feyre scolded him and told him not to be an ass, but ended up giggling as Lucian left the room. She turned to Tamlin and asked if she were to run into the adder again, would she actually see it? Tamlin nodded and advised that it wouldn't be pleasant. She learned that he had glamoured her from the eyes of the adder, that he had done all he could to keep her invisible to creatures like it and worse. He warned that the blight was acting up again and more unruly creatures would be entering his land. He told her if she was to see one to pretend that she had not, ignore it. If it hurt her, Tamlin warned, the results wouldn't be good for it or for him, just like the Naga. Favor began to worry about the blight growing again. Tamlin reminded her that she was safe here, and Feyre, with the hope of a fool, asked if the surge could be temporary. She knew it wouldn't be. The next morning, Feyre found a head in the garden, a literal head that was spiked on a fountain statue. There was enough blood on the stone that she could tell the head was recently removed from its owner. Feyre had only wanted to paint in the garden this morning, but dropped her paints and brushes when she found it. It wore no mask, so she knew it wasn't a member of the spring court, but nothing else. She began backing away and ran into Tamlin and Lucian. Neither Tam nor Lucian knew the identity of the head, but Lucian found a branding behind its ear a mountain with three stars. Tamlin quietly replied that it had to be the night court. Favor remembered that the night court fell upon the northernmost part of Perinthian. It was full of darkness and starlight. She asked why they would have done something as horrendous as this. Tamlin only replied that the night court does what it wants and lives by its own code and corrupt morals. Lucian chimed in saying that they were all sadistic killers who delighted in torture. It was a message for them that the night court could get past their defenses and commit a crime so close to their home. The high lord of the night court would have found it funny as he was a bastard. Feyre looked from the head to the house and guessed it was less than 70 feet away. Tamlin assured her again that she was still safe here and it was only the night court's sick version of a prank. He promised he would not let it happen again. Lucian said the night court would get their karma soon enough as he took the impaled head from the statue. Per Tamlin's request, Lucian left to take care of the head. Tamlin reiterated that Feyre was still safe. The words of the serial surged through her head. Stay with the High Lord, human. You will be safe. Feyre finally stood and stated that if this is the Night Court's version of a prank, it must have only been worse when the humans were enslaved to them. She swore she saw Tamlin's eyes darken. He said that some days he was happy that he was still a kid when his father sent his slaves through the southern border to freedom. She asked him if he thought the slaves had been happy to leave. He thought that they had, even though they had never known freedom or even the seasons of the human realm before. They had no idea what to do in the mortal world, but were still so happy to leave. Tamlin was happy to see them go, even if his father was wasn't. His claws poked out at that statement. Favor reminded Tamlin that he wasn't like his father or his brothers, that he had never made her feel like a prisoner. The shadows remained in his eyes, but he nodded his thanks for her sentiment. She knew there was more to the story before he had been forced into the role of High Lord, but she wouldn't ask. He already had enough on his plate with the Blight to worry about. He had given her space and respect, and she would do the same. That being said, she still couldn't make herself paint that day. Imagine that being your biggest issue of the day. That I can't paint for the day. You couldn't make yourself paint. You know, I have that issue every day. <laughs> so, hey, to tell you, Miss Feyre. I don't remember the last time I painted, so same, Feyre. I was supposed to paint this month, and I couldn't bring myself to do it. Life's hard. Abigail, you paint so well, too. I haven't painted in literally over a year. All my stuff's just sitting downstairs. But I lied. I actually don't really like these chapters. Yeah. <laughs> the more I think about it. In your chapter... I only highlighted one thing. Yeah, there was not a lot to work with in these two. They were definitely shorter chapters. There was something that kind of caught my eye. It could just be me reaching here or me looking into something way more than I need to. At the end of chapter 23, when Feyre, it says that she succumbs to a dark, peaceful sleep, that kind of stuck out to me. You know, Fair is in the spring court. The spring court, no part of it makes me think of darkness being peaceful. There hasn't been a moment where it's like the dark was was anything to do with the spring court. So for her to succumb to a dark, peaceful sleep, it's like that that seems very descriptive and very out of character, out of place. Do you think he like drugged her? What? Do you think he drugged her or something? No, no. I just think it's odd that to her Oh, okay. Gosh, no. I w That's why I was like, uh... 
If I thought he did that, I would not hold back. I don't hold punches with Tamlin, no. I think that it's just interesting to me that to her, peacefulness comes with darkness. Oh, I didn't get what you're getting at, but now I finally did. Not being drugged. That's not where that was going at all. My brain went, oh, so he drugged? That's kind of where it went. Tim Tam Monster Man would be a whole nother level of monster and he'd be on trial for me. Absolutely not. The one thing I highlighted in your chapter was immediately before darkness swallowed everything. Go on. It's when he said, you're exactly as I dream you'd be too. Hmm. Well, Tamlin, that's really weird you say that. Oh, geez. Because I specifically remember him saying, you're not who I thought you'd be for a human. Do you remember him saying that? I do, yes. He really did go out of his way to let her know that he was not impressed with her and that his expectations for humans were not anything he pictured of her. So that is very contradictory. Right. So do you think he's almost telling her what he thinks she wants to hear? Or he was lying to her in the first place. I am really good about finding when people's actions don't match their words and vice versa or something that they said before. I, ve- I remember very specific things. And so the minute that he said that, I was like, really? Because that's funny. Right. That, that's not what you said earlier. Because I know exactly when you didn't say that. Tim Tam the liar man i know specifically that he said you're not who i thought you would be for a human as like a diss to her earlier right it was an insult Mm -hmm. and so now that he's like you're exactly who i thought you'd be i'm like the math ain't math in my friend it's not adding up i already got disrespectful vibes but now i'm starting to get you are a liar vibes manipulative which we kind of picked up on the last episode we said that the at the end the end of my chapter where he was saying none of my other lovers understood how hard my life is yes i can see where he's trying to just play off her emotions but i need to know why i need to understand what he's hoping to achieve if era is not the type of person where she seems like she's just gonna shut down and be completely cold-hearted to anybody she seems open to hearing people's stories even if she starts with hatred you know she, she's willing to work to get to a better place and he's just giving off vibes of dishonesty and controlling and manipulation and i don't understand why like is it because that's how he grew up was he with a family where they had to be deceptive to get what they wanted what's the deal tam something's not adding up but you're that was like the bulk of your chat like this one just didn't just like before it was really hard two chapters where i couldn't find a favorite quote yeah there wasn't much here is there anything else i'm missing in this chapter that you you saw my chapter was like three pages maybe there was not a lot going on here for me hi yeah i cringed in your chapter a lot yeah a lot of secondhand embarrassment here for me on this one lucian is stealing my heart again i am falling for him more than anybody else for the fact that (laughs) he's so funny he made me laugh so hard in the last chapter where he's like, all right, I've got somewhere incredibly important to be. And today he says, if I offer you the moon on a string, will you give me a kiss too? I was like, you smart ass. I want her to be like, yes. And I want to see like him. What? What? <laughs> He'd be like, what? I want to see Lucian get such an unexpected response that he doesn't know what to do with himself. I'm ready for Lucian to get the, the butterflies. It doesn't have to be from Feyre, but I'm ready to see Lucian get... Get the nervousness. I'd love a whole book from his point of view. Yes. One day I would like a book of Lucian finding his person. Especially, I think he deserves it. I'm sorry we're going back a little bit, but I think the fact that he had to watch the person he loved die, that he deserves a book where he gets to, like, he gets to have something good for himself for once. Come on, Lucian. I found it. Oh, share with us, Abby. Okay, so it's page 106. They're in the dining room in... They're doing one of their mini fights, right? And he says, you can't write, yet you learn to hunt and to survive. How? And she said, that's what happens when you're responsible for lives other than your own, isn't it? You do what you have to do. And he goes, you aren't what I expected for a human. Okay, so let's put these side by side. You are not what I expected for a human. And you're exactly how I dreamed you'd be too. I think we got more honesty in the first one because yeah well duh he has no emotion tied in to give him reason to lie to her you know at the first the first time this makes me so mad and i love that that stuck out to me enough for me to be like shut up (laughs) shut your beast mouth tamlin we don't trust you can i tell you what i wrote in the book i said real fucking weird because you said the exact opposite earlier i don't like the inconsistencies tamlin don't appreciate it he 
thinks he can get away with it because she's not fae fairy she's not she's not a fairy so i think he's like what are they gonna do how is she gonna figure it out and she's already in love with him or starting to fall in love with him and so he's slipping in these really nice sweet words and she's not been in a relationship before so how's she gonna know that he's lying to her well and he says stuff like i just want you to stay here and paint and be here safe and protected and i can come home from living my life that's another thing that i freaking highlighted his true colors are showing okay there's a head stuck on a statue my friend stabbed and paled Feyre walks in and finds a head. Yummy. Great. A literal head. Could you imagine going outside to paint and you find a head impaled on a statue with fresh blood and a random, what did they say? What do they call it? Branding, yeah? Yeah, they they branded the dead head. Good. With a night court symbol. So now we find out that the night court is this vicious, awful place where they think it's funny and a prank to leave dead heads on statues. I don't know about you, but that's not what I consider funny. Yeah, I don't think I want to go to the night court if that's the, their pastime. That makes me scared. Fact time with Abby. We learn that the night court does what it wants. They live by their own codes, their own corrupt morals. They're apparently sadistic killers who delight in torturing of every kind. Ew. No, thank you. I guess I want to know why the night court would kill one of their own, brand one of their own, and plant it on the spring court. That seems very specific. Like a stretch? It does. It seems odd. I'm suspicious if the night court really did this, or even if the person whose head it belonged to belonged to the night court as well. All of that seems odd. You wouldn't kill your own man brand your own man and dump them off onto someone else's lands just randomly it's 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 a very odd circumstance the the math ain't math and it's not lining up i don't know that i fully believe this to be right lucian has a response for that he literally says that this is their version of humor he says that this is what they would find to be a funny prank because the high lord of the night court would find this amusing because he's a bastard that's his response. Now, we're a random third party here with Feyre who doesn't know right. the High Lord of the Night Court. And that sounds like a really horrible person. Yes. But if that's what they would find funny, I guess it makes sense. I guess. I still think it's odd that any court would be killing their own people. I feel like it would make more sense to kidnap a spring court member and do those things then it would be to kill your own person and then use them to bake the spring court uncomfy something just still doesn't seem right here well like what's the point right but and like why why like why the spring court why is the spring court even gonna care i don't know it's weird something seems off with this and you know i'm not saying that that's not what's happening it just doesn't add up to me and i think that there's been a lot of that since favor got to prithian especially she really only knows the spring court, the people in the spring court. And a lot of it has been like, I don't get the full story. These things don't add up. Oh, well, accept it and move on. And this just seems like another one of those. Here's this little bit of information I'm going to give you. Right. Like they, they seem to only give her bits and pieces. So I want to trust Tamlin and Lucian. But yet again, we just saw Tamlin contradicting himself. I don't know that we can trust them. Even when it comes to the night court, I don't even know. I don't know. Well, it was just really convenient that it happened and that there was a branding on his ear. And then immediately that's night court. And then Tamlin saying that she's still, he keeps reiterating, you're still safe here. You're safe. Sir, 70 feet from the door of your manor, there's a dead head severed from a body impaled on your statue with no warning and you didn't even find it Feyre found it and you're gonna tell her i won't let it happen again how how are you gonna keep that promise dude please tell me i'd love to know at this point if this is where she's safest i want to know what is going on in all these other courts why are they such sadistic as he said, sadistic, lethal people. Like, but why is the spring court the only one that seems to have any form of discipline? I don't even, 
respect. I, what's the right word? Not humanity, they're fae, but ability to not kill everything for fun and laugh at it. Basic human respect. Basic fae respect. Yeah. It's kind of where I'm going. Right. Or not human. But yeah, that's that's what I'm saying. That's what's the hard part. We can't say humanity here. Decency. Decency. What makes the spring court so much more special than all the rest of the courts? I don't get why the other courts can't show some sort of restraint. Don't kill things unless they're trying to kill you. No, obviously, unless you're from the spring court, everybody else sucks. That's what we've learned so far. From Alice, from Lucian, he came from the autumn court. Now he's at the spring court. Alice came from the summer court and she came to the spring court. Now people are dying and the spring court is such a great place that the night court has to intimidate it. That's what we're getting here. And it feels weird. It does. I think I'm getting really weird vibes that stay you're you're safe you're safe i promise you're safe don't worry you're safe but then the freaking surreal saying stay with the high lord all will be righted you'll be safe how do you fight that yeah i think that when someone tries to convince me of something excessively it makes me not trust that thing okay and him continuously repeating the same thing like trust me trust me trust me it's making you feel uncomfy and she's not asking him though she's not turning to him saying am i safe he's not reassuring her he's like telling her no, no, no you're safe and she's like cool i didn't ask that i didn't bring that up dude like you're the one that keeps reiterating and pushing that i'm safe and i'm not the one worrying about that i just want to know what's going on and you won't even tell me that much all you want to talk about is just trust me you're safe really i promise that's what, it feels creepy. It does. I think that Feyre knows so little about Fae in general and fairies that she just kind of approaches it all with a human humanity sense, like a humanity perspective where she's like, oh, he's just being kind and trying to reassure me instead of the idea that maybe he's trying to redirect me and make me not question further because all she can think is, well, the, the surreal is supposed to know everything and he told me to stay with the high lord so i should just trust it and just not question anything and that's what she's been doing but we're us as readers reading this saying no no Feyre, there are still red flags please look farther than the surface because that's all you're doing i want to point out the serial said stay with the high lord and like all will be righted right like all will be like she'll be safe right that's what he said he literally says all will be righted okay he doesn't say the High Lord will be the one to keep her safe. She just says, stay, he says, stay with the High Lord and I'll be like, that's it. Not that, hey, the High Lord's the one that you're, is going to keep you safe. So I, I don't know. I think that Feyre took the cereal at his word right off the bat instead of looking a little deeper. But isn't he the one that's not allowed to lie? He may not be allowed to lie, but Fey are notoriously deceptive and tricky and good with their words. And as a being who is... But he's not Fey. But how old is he, Abby? Like, he may not be able to lie, but I bet you after hundreds of years of living, he's found ways to use his words at his advantage. Yeah, something's wrong. But this is also like... Something's off. I like a good conspiracy, so maybe I'm stretching it here. Libby, it's so off that she couldn't bring herself to paint. Fey, don't let Tamlin's dr drama rub off onto you. You don't need to be so dramatic. Okay, not only that, but can we talk about how this woman, her issues used to be like, can I? Can I survive? Am I going to be alive next week? Can I make it through the winter? And now she's like, shoot darn. Yeah. I don't know if I can paint today. Let me put my paint by numbers away. Wah, wah. I feel like she's losing herself a little bit. She's like trusting these people and her fight or flight response didn't even come up. She really is kind of becoming this character that Tamlin wants her to be. She doesn't wear dresses. I mean, just a, like what, a couple chapters ago, she's wearing a dress to get a reaction, a, like a turn on reaction to Tamlin. And it's like, that's not you though. Like, you don't do those things. You're not doing that because you want to. You're doing it to re get someone for to him. react. Yes. Okay, but who hasn't done that realistically? I know for a fact I have. Right, but we're talking about Feyre losing herself. And that's not her own... That's just one example where she's not asking to know more information. Whereas when she started, she pushed. She wanted to know where she was at, what was going on. Now she just accepts things. She's okay. Yeah, all right. 
And she just does as she's told. Okay, but again, have you not? You've met your husband young, so me. I had to go through a lot of fish in the sea. There. And I got really good at losing myself in order to please the other person. And I don't think she's consciously doing it. I think she's getting comfortable. Right. It just happens that she's trusting him. And so far, he's taking care of every single issue she had. I'm not intentionally trying to shame Feyre. No. I'm just saying I do agree. I think she absolutely is losing herself in his world. And I think because of that, she's missing out on red flags that we're all picking up on. There's so many at this point. It makes me worried for her. Literally so many red flags. And she is blinded by his emerald mask and blonde long hair and a, probably a pretty hot body. So like, I don't know if I blame her completely, but <laughs> I hope she finds herself again because it's getting really sad. I mean, there's what, five books at this point? I really hope she does. I do want to address though, I think it's hilarious, but I also had a lot of secondhand embarrassment when Feyre realizes that she had been glamored to not know how many fairies were working. We didn't even talk about that. Ugh. Oh my God. Imagine you think you're all by yourself. She wakes up and there's a lady with tree bark for skin in her bedroom. I'm sorry. What? Who are you? Where's Alice? And then Alice starts giggling and like rolling around. It's me, you dummy. You good? She's like, what's your problem? Have you lost it? How freaked out would you be? I'd be like, okay. <laughs> Look at around. Get me out of here. Be like, what do you mean you're Alice? No, Alice does looks like me. Alice does not look like tree bark. Like, right. She looks out and we know this because it's later in the chapter, but she looks out into the garden and sees like, insect masks things with wings taking care of the garden when she has been out there and never seen anything before how overwhelmed would you be i think my reaction would be the same as hers of when i was trying to escape and i thought no one had been around to watch me oh crap everyone saw me i would be thinking back to every little moment where i thought i was alone and like oh my god what did i do what did I do that all these things now saw, all these Faye now saw, that it wasn't quite private like I thought it was? Oh my God, she's like, when I went out after that monster and found out that I was just an idiot and it was like luring me out there, you mean there were people watching? And he's like, oh yeah, buddy, there were so many. Yeah. How do you, how do you think I got there so fast? How do you think I showed up so quickly? He goes, yeah, you had an audience. Oh, okay. I love how she goes, yeah, the ones that didn't look humanoid, they were really shocked that I could see them. And I imagine this, she's been here for months at this point and she's never looked in their direction. And then all of a sudden she's like, they must have thought she was so snooty. <laughs> like, no, I'm sure, I'm sure Tamlin had to say something and they had to know, it had to happen. I hope so. <laughs> Because otherwise, they were probably like, how rude is this stuck up, snotty woman? Well, it makes more sense now. Yeah. Because remember, the adder was just gone. Yes, it was the adder because she said, but I see the adder. So the adder, yeah, he was like, and it was like a deep, muffled, blurred voice. She's like, who are they talking? And now we know it's because he was like flip of a magical little finger. Yeah. You can't see it because I said no. That's also very controlling. I get why he did it because he's like, you would have lost your marbles. You would ne you would be have been terrified. He could have eased her into it. He could have done it. And then like after a few days been like, look, hey, there's a lot more people working here. Just something instead of letting her continue on for what sounds like months now of not realizing that there are all these other people, Faye around. I just imagine her walking out and going, oh my God. Oh, and she said she's shaking when she gets to the dining room because you got, that's all at once, all at once. I would have rather you told me about it and I didn't just discover it. I was not mentally prepared. Thank you for forgetting and letting me discover that and embarrass myself. I don't even know how many times. And you got to think all the time she probably thought she was alone and like went to go. She oh. was, remember, she sneaks down the hallways to get food. Oh, she's walking around with a chocolate chip cookie hanging out of her mouth. And she doesn't realize that all these fair are just like, what is she doing? 
They're probably like, she can't see us. Hello? Oh, poor girl. You know, it'd be funny if like she walks into the kitchen to get food and like they're cleaning up and putting it away and she's just like taking it out right and right, right after they just put it away and they're like, we just cleaned that up. And they're like, I, well, yeah, she can't see us. So we're, sucks of, suck for us. This is a, a behind the scenes question, but how would they clean without her noticing like stuff's floating? Was everything they touched glamored too? You know, I'm assuming magical. They just kind of like, kind of like how Tamlin can, with a flick of his wrist, things happen or disappear or appear. I bet they kind of have the same abilities with cleaning, I think. Or maybe they're waiting till she's asleep. I, I really have no idea. No answers. Best DSJM, if you want to fill us in, correct us, please. If we're wrong, please let us know. Poor Alice is like, it's me, buddy. We're friends now. I've talked to you for a very long time. And she's like, you have tree bark for skin. <laughs> I'm amazed she didn't say anything. Like, bless her heart. She never, like, made Alice feel bad. I don't think I would say anything either. If Alice was like, I've always looked this way, I'd be like, yeah, yep, yep. I'm not about to out myself. You sure have. I've always noticed it. I, yep, I just, half awake still. Sorry, excuse me. Don't mind my... My morning silliness. I am not having a, an existential crisis at this very moment. A mental breakdown. So basically, Tamlin is a liar McLiar face. Again. Again. He kissed her. Again. He kissed her and he's like, hey, now you can hear sounds and see things you haven't seen. Also, Alice has tree bark. And also, there's a dead man's head. From the night court. Good luck. Do you think the head was glamored? Do you think that it's just been sitting there for a while? No. No, because Tamlin would have gotten rid of it before Feyre knew. Hopefully it wasn't planted. If he was going to remove the glamour, which he did, why wouldn't you prepare her more? I don't get it. Why did you just blindly let her walk into finding out her world is a lot bigger than she realized it was? Libby? We have a really cool star. I mean, every week we have a cool star of the week. We have an especially cool star of the week this week. Her name is Teresa Sharon, and she's actually a fantasy author, which is just super cool. Do you want to actually, you know her sort of personally. Do you want to explain how you know her? So I know her because she worked at a jeweler, and I started out with a pearl engagement ring. And nobody told us that pearls are very soft, so it broke. And we had, we were like, let's uh, let's get one that's not going to break every uh, every month. So we went, and she was actually one of the people working in the store and helped us pick out a new one. And she was just super fun to talk to and just really nice. And then later on, I found out she was a photographer. And then when I was 24, my mom was actually pregnant. Uh, yes, my siblings are significantly younger than me. Just a little bit. Some of them. <laughs> Just some of them I grew up with and the others are growing up with my child. So <laughs> fun. It's fun. So, yeah. So when she was pregnant, um, we, they were looking for a maternity, someone to take maternity photos. And I found out that Teresa actually did maternity photos. So I reached out to her. And we ended up getting her to do maternity photos for my mom. And so I got to meet her again that way. Again, I'm very talented, super fun to work with. She was just an absolute joy. She lights up a room. So I, well, I shouldn't say that. Oh my gosh. That's, that's like serial murder podcast stuff. Like, she lights, she up, lights a room. up a room. Oh my gosh, guys. I'm so sorry, Teresa. I take it back. You're a normal person. Don't serial killers back off. So yeah, I know she's super fun. So she, like I said, is absolute doll. She and I have very, I feel like very similar energies. Yes. I was surprised you hadn't met her because in the same area that we lived, you had lived there too. So I was actually very shocked that y'all had never crossed paths. I would love to shoot with her one day because I feel like her styles match really well. Um, but she's got a little blurb here that I'm going to read for you. Again, her name is Teresa Sharon. Her Instagram is Ter T Teresa Sharon. It's real easy, my friend. It's just <laughs> her name. Before I get into her about me, I just want to reiterate, she is an author. She's written her first book, and it is pronounced Elysian. So she has written a book called The Fate of the Elysian, and it is a book that is fantasy. So for all of our fantasy lovers here, if we're talking about indie authors, 
we've got one for you. So actually we should probably get her in contact with our last star of the week because that's lo what Jordan loves. So we should definitely hook them up. So this is what Sharon has to say. I've never been one for sports, but I've always been the one for art. I started writing this book in high school and stopped at chapter two. I just couldn't continue. Now she is 29 years old and she finally finished the book. She's already working on the novella that will be released by late next month, the end of August, 2023, and working on book two while writing two other book series. Her goal is to transition from an indie author to having an agent or publisher for her whole series. The fate of Elysian is getting a whole makeover soon rebanding of the covers, re-editing the inside. So she's excited for people to see the new makeover. She went to state for UIL creative writing and got third place in high school. She's always loved to create a world that she could escape to. And now her readers get to do the same. She's done a one act play since fifth grade, and she truly believes in the craft of art and creating a story led her to writing. Ever since then, she's had a passion to be an author, but never fulfilled it until now. She's a lover of dystopian, which the fate of Elysian is a dystopian sci-fi fantasy series. She loves the idea of creating a world that is unique and different, something completely out of the box, which is how the series is. The Fate of Elysian will be a trilogy series with three novellas. She'd love to continue writing her other series, but as of now, she wants to focus on completing book one for each of the series. The other series are straight fantasy. She's the one that always wants to write something different than any other book out there. She doesn't read other books. She doesn't want to get distracted or influenced by another story. Her brain and mind is so fresh when she writes. She writes from the heart and soul and uses her own creativity, which she truly feels is her strength. So we've heard a lot about the book, The Fate of Elysian. Are you okay if I read the, the blurb about it? I'd like to hear it. Okay, it says, Will you live a life that is predestined and controlled from your first breath of air, a life full of darkness, destruction, and pain, where your existence is owed to the survival of humanity? Faye's 18th birthday turns her life upside down, just like the rest of the teens who walked this planet before her. She must travel to the city. She knows she would never return the same, if she ever returns. In a futuristic world founded to cope with the effects of a famine that altered the the course of humanity, there are certain commandments to follow to live a prosperous life. Faye steps into the city of dreams with several unanswered questions. All she has is a mysterious symbol to find her soulmate, who was predestined at birth. Not knowing who her symbol will light up for, she must trust her judgment or destiny. Will her judgments be right? Her rebelliousness leads her to uncover a disturbing truth about the city, which is known as their Elysian. But is it just that? Along with others, Faye is determined to find the missing pieces and bring justice to herself, her family, and her friends. She is fearless. She is not afraid to challenge those who are in power. Has her entire life been a lie? Does she want to fight to be with the love of her life or settle with the soulmate chosen by the city at the time of her birth? Faye must decide. So as I am currently finishing the entirety of the mass collection, I have not yet read her book, but it is on the top of my TBR after I finished the Throne of Glass series, which we all know is gonna take 17 years, but I am so excited to read this. I absolutely love dystopian societies. It is my favorite trope of all the tropes there are. So I cannot wait to read this. We're gonna go ahead and link so you can buy this on Amazon. I do believe it's part of the Kindle Unlimited. So any of my Unlimited users, go ahead and get it on your Kindle and let me know what you think. So calling all dreamers, you know, before we inevitably beg you to come and talk to us, I want to give a huge shout out. We got our first email from Victoria and Woo! yes, it made our day. We were absolutely thrilled. We still are talking about it. She was super funny, super sweet. She said something that really stuck out to us. Hopefully you're starting to get some emails and those bruises from that cauldron damn chair are healing. Abby, are the bruises healing? They're gone. It only took three weeks. They're gone. Three weeks? Three weeks. And I don't think I put it on our story, but I will put it out on a release date. I know everybody's been on pins and needles here. <laughs> I got a new chair. Got a new chair. She did it. Woo. It's beautiful. I'm sitting in it right now. It's great. All right. All right. So back to it. Reach out to us. You could be our second email. A cord of thorns and podcast at gmail.com. You could also reach out to us through our Instagram DMs. Go ahead, slide in there. I'll give you more pickup lines if you want them. Don't tempt me. It will not take much prodding. <gasps> Can they send in some pickup lines? Oh, please send us pickup lines. Send, oh, oh, even better. Send us the pickup lines that you think, whichever character in Akatar that you think a character would use. Oh, I got it. Can you please send me 
some cheesy Tamlin or Lucian pickup lines. I want to hear them. Can we move on to book two so I can ask for pickup lines from like Cassian? I wish. All right, moving on. To the people who listen and the dreams that are answered. We'll see you next week. And remember, don't let the hard days win. I know you can hear me from the dark. I know you're listening from afar. We find Favor laying in the glass, strategizing in the glass. She's laying in glass, guys. Broken glass. Welcome to the spring court. Mm, that sounds not good. <laughs>